Hey guys and welcome to Sasquatch Theory. In this episode we have an email that was sent in from Moorhead, Minnesota. This was an interesting email to me because I was able to relate with the writer on a few points about the Sasquatch activity and the spiritual side of the Bigfoot. If you have a Bigfoot encounter that you would like to share on the channel, you can email me at sasquatchtheory at outlook.com. All right, let's not waste any more time so we can keep shoveling through these emails and let's get straight into it. Hi, my name is Alex. I was born on April of 1982. I'm from Minnesota. I have been raised in small towns and out in the country my entire life. I'm lucky to have had parents that had faith in how they raised me. I am what you would call a free-range kid, meaning my parents knew I had a good head on my shoulders and I had common sense. Hunting, fishing, and camping, nature and the outdoors have been in my blood since I was born. I spent nearly every weekend with my parents going camping and fishing as a kid. We lived for the outdoors. I began going deer hunting with my dad at the age of three, duck hunting a few years after that. I had a way with animals, and I was a loner, and I kept to myself. I had no complaints about playing alone. I had a very good imagination, and I was very open-minded. My mom always told me I was born a thousand years too late. She said that I belonged up in the mountains with all the wild animals. My mom always knew that I had a way with animals, and she couldn't explain it. She always had this feeling that I was here for something. My dad gave up his summers working 14-hour days, six days a week as a loader operator for a major gravel operation. But when it came to November, that's when he was done. And no ifs or buts about it because... When the first weekend of deer hunting came, we were gone for two weeks sometimes. Deer hunting in Minnesota is almost like a holiday, and should be a holiday. Some schools shut down in northern Minnesota. They used to, anyway. My dad had deer hunting in his blood, and he lived for it. I was a very quiet kid most of the time, very shy, and I kept to myself. But every deer hunting season, I would lose my voice on the ride up by asking all the questions that my mind could possibly think of. On November of 2014, I lost my mom to complications stemming from leukemia. It was hard on me because I lost my best friend. I had actually stopped going up north hunting, camping, and fishing because I had just had a kid a couple years back, and well, life, it takes control sometimes. After my mom died, I made it a mission of mine to get back to what I love, to what I know, what you would call my church and my first home, which is nature. So I began camping again, and I would bring my daughter. Things got crazy again. A shed that I rented with my ex-girlfriend got broken into, and I had roughly about $10,000 worth of camping equipment stolen, so that kind of put an end to that. Fast forward to last year. My dad found out he had lung cancer. Unfortunately, he didn't make it on December 18th of 2020. My hero, my teacher, my dad was no longer here. My ex had recently broke up with me and threw me out, and I was homeless at the time. I may have been 39 years old, but at that point, I was just an orphan. The hole that was left, I couldn't fill. And with everything that was going on in my life, not just my dad, but with my ex-girlfriend, my mind was completely overloaded and I couldn't take anymore. I was lost. I felt very alone. It was hard for me to come up with reasons to live for the next day. I am very thankful for my new girlfriend because she helped to save me. Shortly after my dad died, I got his truck. It was a 05 Chevy Silverado Z71 short box. As soon as I got it, I started planning on going up to the woods. The great outdoors is a place where I was able to find myself again. The silence of the woods seemed to help put my mind at ease. 
It was the solitude and the comfort of nature. Enough about the tragic parts of my life. Let's get to it. I started going up to this area where my father had brought me all my life. It's roughly 100 miles from where I live, literally in the middle of nowhere. There are two major highways in between this deer shack on the Canadian border with practically all forest in between. It's roughly 10 miles off the highway on a forest road that eventually you get to a two track and then the deer shack is two miles down that road. The nearest house is probably at a resort two and a half miles away. Otherwise, I'm only aware of one other deer shack on this entire stretch. It had been a while since I was up in the woods because, again, life has its evil ways of taking what matters to you and replacing it with what society thinks is right. So I was a little rusty when it came to noticing things. I need to add before I get to this. My dad has hunted this area since 1969. In 1989, my dad started to bring my grandfather up here to hunt. The next year, they began to lease some land and they built a deer shack. I believe it was the fall of 1990. We were up there building deer stands. It was in the afternoon and I remember telling my dad I was going to go for a walk with my BB gun up east of the deer shack on an old track logging road. I don't remember too much except for being up there and getting really surprised by this creature that I've never seen before. I remember it growling and it was a really low tone. I also remember it scaring the crap out of me. I ran back to the deer shack and I told my dad about the figure that I seen. He said it was just a bear, and that was it. From there on, I would absolutely refuse to go outside and use the bathroom, let alone walk to the outhouse alone in the middle of the night because I was scared to death, and I don't know why. It would be like that for years until I would go outside on my own with a high-powered rifle. I never really told anybody that except for recently, because in reality, who is scared of the boogeyman? And from that moment on, I would have 32 years of hints given to me, be it tree knocks, tree structures, that were really odd, and they weren't supposed to be there. I would hear rock clacking, tree snapping, and even getting followed out of the woods multiple times by something. And every time I would come up with some type of excuse, I would brush it off. One of my dad's favorite sayings was, Don't let you get to yourself in the woods. I started going back to this area in early January of 2022, and instantly things started happening. My girlfriend would have more experiences because she paid attention. Honestly, my mind was not prepared to handle any more craziness, and it almost refused to acknowledge anything that was going on. Every time we were up there and would randomly stop to use the bathroom or to take a picture, we would hear rock clacks, tree breaks, tree knocks, and even growls. This happened multiple times every time we were there. I couldn't get back to the deer shack because the snow was too deep, so we just went up and went on some roads that were passable because I wanted to spend my time in nature. We finally arrived back to the area in late March. Every time we were up there, my girlfriend would say it felt like we were being watched. I just brushed it off because she's a city girl, but boy was I wrong. We went up there one night, and when we got up there, there is a grouping of birch trees that was perfectly healthy, and they were all pushed over. They were all pushed over the two track that was on the way to the deer shack, so I got out and cut them with my axe and my bow saw. We arrived at the deer shack and began to make something to eat. All we had for light was a Coleman propane lantern, headlamps, and flashlights. We had just got done eating, and it was probably around 1 in the morning. I had just dropped off the lantern, and a rock hits the roof of the deer shack. I wasn't too sure what it was, so I just brushed it off. That was about all that happened that weekend. The next weekend, we made it back up to the deer shack. 
The snow had just melted and we were sitting around the campfire. Again, we had that eerie feeling of being watched. I was exhausted and fell asleep immediately. My girlfriend couldn't sleep and stayed awake, reading a book. She laid in bed and heard the front doorknob rattle on the deer shack like somebody walked up, grabbed it, and rattled it in their hand. My girlfriend finally managed to wake me up. My first thought was, we are out in the middle of nowhere. Who the heck would be rattling the doorknob? I got up and looked out the windows, and I looked out the front door. It was lightly snowing, and I didn't see any tracks. We ended up leaving that day, being that my girlfriend had to work. The next time we would go up there, it was my birthday, and my girlfriend surprised me by taking us up there. It was the weekend of April 17th, and we were planning on staying up there until the 21st. When we arrived, we noticed an odd amount of tree breaks in the area. Again, I just brushed off the sign and the activity. I was taught to pay attention to everything, and my mind just did not have a place to file this type of information. We arrived at the deer shack and did our usual thing around the fire. I enjoyed going rock hunting by myself and being alone with my thoughts. My girlfriend would be the one to notice all the weird things happening, so her side of the story is just as important as mine and fills in a lot of the intricate details that my mind refuses to process. It was the morning of April 20th, 2021. I couldn't sleep and I got up early. While my girlfriend slept, I went out to try to find one of the first deer stands me and my father built and hunted out of together. It was about 6.30, 7 in the morning. I was about a quarter mile away from the deer shack about to go in and find it, when I had a weird feeling stop me, and I began to hear these noises which my brain automatically tried to find the type of animal associated to it. I didn't really pay much attention to it, but I remember thinking to myself it was either a swan, Canadian geese, or possibly a raven, and my brain tried to push it out. Later that day, we were outside sitting around the campfire again, and we heard a growl. A bear came to mind, and we weren't sure what it was, so we ran inside the cabin and waited to see if the thing would come out. We waited roughly an hour before I ventured back outside to make sure it was safe again. We both ventured down the trail looking for any tracks in the snow. All I found were some fox tracks that went across a beaver dam. This is the point where I realized I wasn't seeing very much wildlife, and there was hardly any tracks. There wasn't any deer tracks, which was super unusual. It was at that moment I realized that there was a lack of wildlife in the area. My first thought was that there was predators around such as wolves and mountain lions. I decided to walk down another beaver pond to check it out. Again, there wasn't any deer sign, and I think this was the beginning of the red flags. We decided to walk back since it was late afternoon. In the evening, my girlfriend and I went out for a short drive. I was going to take her to a lake that's roughly a mile as the crow flies, so she could get some awesome pictures of the sunset. We got to the lake and I parked the truck in a spot where the lake is down to her left, down a very steep incline, but with a pretty good view of the lake in front of us, framing the sun perfectly. We both had to use the bathroom, so we both got out, she was going to the bathroom on her side, and I was going to the bathroom on the driver's side. I pulled a 2x4 out of the back of my truck, and being the smartass that I am, I decided, let's tree knock, very jokingly. I took my 2x4, and I hit the tree three different times consecutively. I paused, and then I knocked a few more times. And that is when we heard it. In front of my truck on the left side, we heard heavy footsteps like somebody dragging their feet in the leaves. The thing was that hit me instantly was bipedal footsteps. Heavy bipedal footsteps. I remember looking at my girlfriend and seeing that look on her face. Ghost white and the footsteps continued for probably 5 or 10 seconds. And then they stopped for about 10 seconds. Heavy and more dragging of the feet. It stopped, and 10 seconds later it started again, but behind me, to the left, almost at a perfect angle from the driver's side. Moments later we heard a loud growl, 
and a tree snap. I looked at my girlfriend and I told her, I believe it's time we go. And she was in total agreement. We were in shock, but I knew what we heard. This is in the middle of nowhere of remote Minnesota. Now, I'm not sure if he's comparing this area to the Superior National Forest or if he's saying it's in the Superior National Forest. Um, I'm trying to do my best to read the story out and narrate it, so just bear with me. I knew that there was absolutely no way that was somebody just out walking around in the woods. For it to make the bipedal sounds it did, it had to have been big. One time we were driving to the shack and we noticed that a bunch of deer were running next to my truck. I remember the look in that deer's eyes, the look of terror. The deer paid no attention to us and was really focused on the woods. It was then that I think stuff started hitting me and we got to the road that would bring us to the deer shack. It seems like all the wildlife disappears when we get close to the deer shack. Again, we had the feeling of being watched. I had just sat down, and that's the moment that I heard this really loud growl. It sounded like a mountain lion or possibly like a bear. I have had run-ins with bears before, and this was different. My instincts told me that we were somewhere that we were not supposed to be. And from that moment, I was struck with terror. I got back in the truck, and I slammed the door. All of a sudden... Everything started flooding back inside my mind. All those memories back from 1990. Words cannot express how shocked I really was. I sat there for what seemed like an eternity, and I heard a few tree snaps to my right. As I began to hear more tree snaps, I started to honk and shine my lights into the woods. I was at a weird angle and I wasn't able to see what created the snap. So I was trying to back my truck up so I could pull forward and get an angle in between the trees to see what it was when I caught it out of the corner of my eye to my left. I caught eye shine, but different eye shine. I remember it was an orange red color and as I turned my head to look, the eye shine went away. But the moon was just bright enough and it was just a little bit of snow on the ground that I saw the outline. The outline of this creature was massive. It was roughly 9 feet tall and about as wide as my truck. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I always wanted to believe in Bigfoot, but never really could. It was at that moment that I became a full on believer. But I knew at that moment that Sasquatch existed, and I also knew at that moment we had to get out of there. I remember looking down at my phone for a moment, and when I looked back up, it was gone. So I backed up my truck up to the deer shack, and we got out and quickly got inside. When we got inside, the look on my girlfriend's face told me everything. She witnessed and experienced everything with me. We both reassured each other what we experienced and wasted no time getting out of there. I came out of the bedroom and around the table and it was at that moment that I couldn't believe my eyes and at that same moment my truck stopped in the panic mode and everything got dark again. I told my girlfriend to look out the window and to watch the front lights of my truck and tell me if I'm crazy or if I'm actually seeing what I'm seeing. I hit the panic button again and I couldn't believe it, but her look reaffirmed what we were looking at. We sat and watched as you can see my truck getting pushed back and forth and side to side. We hid in the house for a while and then we managed to get out of there by using fireworks and lighting them up and throwing them outside. Okay, so this next part was a little hard for me to understand, but I think him and his girlfriend were throwing cocktails to scare the creatures away. But it got me to my truck and we got in and drove 90 miles straight back at 2 a.m. in the morning. We were both in shock the next morning. I was trying to come to terms with what just happened along with dealing with everything else. 
My girlfriend and I inspected the truck and we found what looked like a handprint or possibly a footprint on the truck. I told one of my friends what happened and he actually believed me. We went back up to the deer shack fully armed. When we arrived at the deer shack, we noticed a lot more tree breaks than what there was before. Nothing happened the entire day. I had parked my truck like I parked it the night before. It was at that moment I heard the footsteps again, and I knew that we were not alone. I walked back to my friend and told him, we are not alone. We were both on high alert. We sat there and prepared to defend ourselves. We were both excellent shots. We can pick up anything and instantly be dead accurate. But we wouldn't have to because whatever it was stayed away and eventually left. They knew we were armed. We decided to go for a walk around 3.30 or 4 in the morning. We couldn't sleep because our adrenaline was rushing. We walked into the area where I had stopped myself the day before. We had found a few beds and it looked like something big had been laying inside of them. We also seen a bunch of large trails going in and out of the woods. Nothing else happened that morning, so we packed our stuff up and went home. I was very hesitant after that to go back to the deer shack, but I knew I had to. In July, I returned to the area by myself, and the Sasquatch actually found me and followed me around. I don't believe the Sasquatch is like a primate or a monkey. They are more like us. I feel like they tried driving us out of the area because it was possibly special to them. I now know that the giant I saw in 1990 was real, and these creatures really do exist. Ever since that experience, the Sasquatch show up in my dreams and show me tree structures and tell me what things mean. I know it sounds crazy, but it is what it is. I believe they waited 32 years, slipping me hints, trying to get my attention, and they waited until I was in the state I was to show me a reason for life. My life was reborn that April night. I went from a guy who didn't know how I was going to make it through the next day to a guy who is currently planning and trying to fund at least a nine-month solo expedition to find the forest giants. I can't explain what it did to me in words, and people have accused me of being obsessed. How can you not be? It's hard to get people to understand the feelings one feels after something like this. When myth becomes legend in your own eyes, you'll realize. You'll question everybody and everything. I had a hard time including the word paranormal and Sasquatch together, but as each day goes by, the more and more I think it is. I can't explain the things I know about Sasquatch. It's like all this knowledge was put in me, and it took April to unlock everything. This is not the complete story because my girlfriend's experiences are missing. I can only explain what I experienced when I was with her. That's my story. There isn't one fictitious word in it. I don't lie. It changed my life. It woke me up. It gave me reason. I am set on a mission that no matter how long it takes, I will be on it. I no longer argue with skeptics and non-believers because I know one day everything we think we know will be turned upside down. This is the first time I ever put this in words, and forgive me, I used Google Voice because I suck at typing. Thanks for reading. Alex from Moorhead, Minnesota. Hey Alex, and thank you for voicing in your email, and I really appreciate you picking my channel to share your experiences. It could be possible they were using the cabin for shelter, I know the weather gets bad and these things will get in caves, barns, and abandoned shacks out in the woods. Maybe sometimes when people think it's a bear that got in, it very well could have been a Sasquatch. How are you going to know the difference anyways? I guess bears are messy to where a Sasquatch is more conspicuous and mysterious. I am sorry to hear about the loss of your parents and I know everyone listening is sending you their prayers. The Sasquatch seemed to have a way to show up 
when a series of bad events happen in our life. That's certainly spiritual because they know the right moment to show up and rattle you up. It's almost like they want to distract your mind and show you there is more out there than just suffering. They are the watchers and I believe they watch over us. Or it's something bad like an omen, like something bad's going to happen in our life. I remember listening to episode 5 on Bigfoot Odyssey and when Carey was still alive he talked about the loss of life within his family and how he went out in the woods to turkey hunt to get it off his mind and that's when he encountered the Sasquatch and you know that thing was shaking the tree and he really had a hard time getting out of there safely and I know it really affected him and I related to that story because when I heard it, I went through a series of very, very bad events. It wasn't the loss of life, but it was the loss of my life in a way, you know, everything that I held dearly. So I know there's definitely something going on with the Sasquatch showing up at that right moment in our lives when everything seems to be hell out there. I am really glad you found a new girlfriend and I know what it's like, man. I had my sightings when I lost a lot in my life, including my ex. That's Bigfoot telling you, you don't need her, man. You know, it's one thing when you hear that from your friends and family, but when Bigfoot shows up, you know it's serious business. My spiritual experience with the Sasquatch has been noted as a place and time sort of thing, and they seem to be able to know things they shouldn't. I feel it was God's way of saying there is more to life and I will show you. Also, I think a nine-month expedition would be a good idea if you were in the deep woods away from people and if it was an area with a history and multitude of eye sightings. I definitely think that would be cool, and if you're anywhere near me, let me know. I'm, I might show up. Another thing I wanted to mention about the spiritual is Alex was using the outdoors to get away from the hurt in his life, and that's another thing that myself and also Carrie Arnold was doing. Here's my theory. When you experience a lot of bad in your life, something gets turned off in your brain eventually. Like you're not able to feel anymore and you just feel dead inside. So my theory is, this is from my experience, when I would be out there in the woods, it's almost like our minds are naturally sending out some type of distress signal and the Sasquatch key in on that and come in to see what's wrong. I'm not sure, but maybe it's a hominid thing and we've lost touch with that. Anyways, I normally don't talk and open up about this type of stuff and it's all theory anyways. We don't really know what happened out there other than comparing our lives to the situation that happened. Anyways, Alex, I appreciate you sending me your story in and if you have a Sasquatch encounter that you would like to share with me, you can contact me at sasquatchtheory at outlook.com. All right, guys. That's it for today, and I really appreciate everyone listening. Until the next one, take care.